Hi, I'm Marlo from Wild Food UK, out foraging again. It's the 9th of October, uh, and more importantly, we've had a fair bit of rain in the last few days, in the last week or so. There was a dry week just before, but there's been rain and the temperature has dropped. So what's happened is, uh, in the last week or so, a lot of uh, the sort of early autumn mushrooms have kind of gone to bed for the year because they don't like it when it gets too cold at night. And we've got the start of the kind of second autumn flush coming out right now and uh, you guys seem to like that back to basics little series I did at the beginning of lockdown um, so I thought I'd try something a bit more along those lines with this video um, and I'm actually going to try some video editing for the first time for our hundredth video on Wild Food UK's YouTube channel so uh, forgive me if the editing's a bit sketchy but I hope you like the content and the content is starting just down here with the first mushroom that we saw that we thought was worth talking about. There's been a few others around. There's another youngster, another very young one there. And this slightly bigger one there. They're all quite immature, actually. The, uh, the caps uh, of this mushroom will flatten out into something very akin to your portobellos. I'll just cut this bigger one and show you a few things. So uh, this isn't a back to basics video because uh, there's no basics in the mushroom world. But if I was doing a back to basics video for mushrooms, the family I would start on is this one. This is an agaricus mushroom, which is the same family as uh, pretty much all the mushrooms you buy in the shops, the button mushrooms, closed cut mushrooms. That's kind of what this is at the moment. This is a closed cut mushroom. And then it will turn into a button mushroom as the cap comes away from the stem. It will leave a little ring on the stem and it will expose the gills, which are hidden and mostly eaten, actually. Now you can see those gills are pink. And it's a stout white stemmed mushroom with a white cap. But it's going to, as I say, flatten out. This would have become quite a large agaricus mushroom which leads me to believe that it's a, a young horse mushroom, Agaricus arvensis. So the way that we tell whether we've got an edible or a poisonous agaric, there are poisonous members of this family that look incredibly similar to this, is we damage it, first of all. You can see a tiny bit of uh, slight yellowing, I suppose, there where it was damaged before. And where I've just run the knife over the cap, there's a tiny bit more yellowing. Now that's a little worry in the agaric world because uh, the poisonous agaric um, that, that is most commonly found is called the yellow stainer uh, and it stains yellow. Brighter than that though generally but any yellowing is a bit of a worry in the agaric world. The yellow stainer accounts for the most poisonings that we have in Britain each year because it looks so much like a field mushroom or a horse mushroom, which, uh, like I say, I still believe that's what we've got here. Because uh, it's stained yellow, though, you can see it's becoming slightly brighter. Because it's stained yellow, I'm going to apply the second test that we do when we find an agaric and smell it. And what I've got there is the most amazing smell of aniseed. This is really, really quite a strong smelling one. And that's a good thing because that does mean that I've got my horse mushroom, uh, Agaricus arvensis. It's uh, one of the tastiest mushrooms around, in my opinion. It doesn't get too much kudos in the forager world because it's quite common and uh, it's so similar to the mushrooms that you get in the shops that it doesn't seem quite so adventurous as some of the others I'm going to show you, I suppose. Um, but from a taste point of view, it's absolutely lovely. I'm going to leave these babies. I don't like picking mushrooms that young. I probably wouldn't even have picked this one if it wasn't for the fact I was doing the video. I would have come back in a couple of days to get it when it was slightly more mature, uh, because by that point the cat would have opened and it would have dropped at least some of its spores. But considering how much of the spores, or sorry, the gills have already been munched by a slug, I assume. I'm not sure it would have been worth waiting. Anyway, uh, just over here, we have another slightly more interesting mushroom for the mitophile. 
but not for the forager. I'll just let you get yourself into a comfy position there, Eric. And if you could pan down, we've got, first of all here, very strange looking thing. And there's another one behind it and a few more around. This one here, slightly more accessible amongst the brambles. And what I'm gonna try to do is get down to the base of it without breaking it, because they are very fragile. Let's see if I can get the whole thing out for you. Yeah, there you go. I can show you. It grows from an egg. <laughs> this is a mushroom called the, uh, the dog stinkhorn. It's much less common than the, uh, the horse mushroom, so it's uh, a nice find. Like I say, it's good to see this mushroom, um, but it's not one that's going in the forager's bag today. This is not one that I would like to eat. It doesn't look particularly appetizing uh, for a start, but some books class it as inedible. Um, and when that happens, I just err on the side of caution and I, uh, I'd recommend everyone else did the same. Uh, this mushroom, it's in the stinkhorn family. Some of you might have seen the normal common stinkhorn, Phallus impudicus. It'll get to about a foot high and look incredibly phallic with a sort of black tip for half a day until the flies come and take all of the black stuff off and uh, fly away and hopefully seed some more stinkhorns. Um, it's a very common mushroom and uh, it lives up to its name. It is stink before the flies remove all of uh, all of the black stuff. Um, this one is nowhere near as stinky, uh, but it obviously does want to attract insects, I assume, which will take away the spores which would be on the tip of uh, this rather phallic looking little mushroom. Um, the eggs of uh, the common stinkhorn are considered edible, um, but I've not read anything about anyone eating even the eggs of uh, the dog stinkhorn. Mutinous uh, caninis, I believe, is its scientific name. Anyway, there's the dog stinkhorn. Uh, if you're lucky enough to see these, just leave them where they are. Um, they're a lovely find, but we're gonna go and find some other things that are edible and poisonous and interesting, if you'd like to follow me. Right, well, we've come just a little bit further along and now I'm gonna give you some really useful information, probably some of the most useful information that I'll give you in this video, because it's all about trees and habitats. Um, when you're foraging for mushrooms, knowing a little bit about trees and habitats is gonna give you uh, an advantage when you're out searching for, for your mushrooms, because the mushrooms that we go after largely fall into two categories. So the, the saprophytes or the saprobic mushrooms, they're the rotters as far as I'm concerned. And they'll grow on various different types of dead wood and, and woodland detritus. But the other type of uh, fungus that we go after a lot as foragers are the mycorrhizal fungi. Now, they're the ones that live underground and they can get huge underground. Um, they're kind of made up of this three-dimensional spider's web called mycelium, which is made up of these tiny little tubes called hyphae. Um, but underground, they can't hunt and they can't find their own food sources. So what they have to do is build what's called a mycorrhizal relationship with effectively a host organism where they use their hyphae to kind of break into the roots of uh, what can be a tree or a plant. Um, and then what they do is they actually feed and help that tree or that organism by providing it an extra uh, space of root system which can tap into extra nutrient resources like water sources or even uh, mushrooms can even break down rocks and get minerals out to feed to their host trees and they do seem to do it in quite an intelligent way because they want the tree or, or the plant that they're growing with to be big and strong because in return that tree gives the mushroom what it needs to survive. Now, um, these mycorrhizal fungus, most of them are, are quite fussy. They'll only grow with certain types of trees. So if you want to find a specific type of mushroom, look in your books to see what trees it grows with first. But I can give you a bit of a head start here because there's certain organisms in Britain that are just head and shoulders above the rest for edible fungus. And I'm standing in amongst four of them right now. So number one for edible mycorrhizal fungus is this tree that I've got behind me. It's quite hard to zoom in on the leaves from where you are, but this is a beech tree. 
which is easily recognisable if you look at the floor because we've got our beech nuts all over the floor around it. Now, the beech tree is one of my favourite trees for a number of reasons. You can make beech leaf noyer out of it. The leaves are edible in spring, although they get papery quite quickly. Uh, but the reason it's one of my favourite trees is because it has uh, the widest variety of edible fungus growing with it in Britain. Now, second to the beech tree is our oak tree, just over there. Oak trees, I'm sure you all know what uh, an oak leaf looks like, but again, if there's no leaves on the tree, look at what's on the floor, our lovely acorns. Oak trees are pretty much on an even par with the beech when it comes to edible fungus. They're the top two organisms for edible mycorrhizals in the UK. And uh, there's loads of beech and oak around here, which um, means that there's loads of mushrooms. And obviously someone else thought that too, because. There's a bit of awful tagging on these beech trees here, but it does look quite a lot like, if you zoom in here, that someone's tagged a mushroom onto the tree, possibly because this is a good mushroom spot. Now, those are the top two organisms. Third is grass. Grassland is where we go foraging for mushrooms in spring and summer, because that's where you find most of your edible summer and spring fungus. Um, so grass is number three. But over here, we've got number four. They stand out in the forest because of their lovely white bark. You can see there in the distance, those birch trees. That's your top four organisms. Now mix that with a bit of moss all over the floor and you've got a mushroom forager's paradise because beech, oak, birch, grass and moss that means a wide variety of edible fungus, including things like your chanterelles and your porcinis. Um, you won't find a winter chanterelle here or a saffron milk cap because they like pine trees and evergreens, but around here, there's a lot of different edible fungus just because of the mature trees and the environment that we're in. Now, one last tree, it's not as high up on the list as uh, the ones that we were just talking about, but these two trees, I think this is the easiest way to go, if you could follow me. <laughs> I think from here, from about here, you'll get the best shot. And there's a few trees like this up here. This is a lovely old chestnut tree. It looks absolutely magnificent. You can see that kind of twisted, gnarled bark that tells you you've got a sweet chestnut tree. Now, when you see a tree this mature, you can be pretty sure that it's going to have some fungus growing with it anyway, even if it's not a beech, an oak or a birch. Um, this one here is actually the host organism of a mushroom I'm going to show you in just a minute called uh, the beefsteak fungus. It's um, a mushroom that's uh, exclusive to sweet chestnut and oak trees. So I'm going to show you that on an oak tree in just a minute, but I just wanted to finish this little section about the good trees with our lovely chestnut. Last little bit about this though, because uh, it's good to know what's at the top, you know, your beech, oak and birch. It's also good to know what's at the bottom, because if you're out in autumn foraging in a wood full of ash, you're in the wrong place. There's not many mycorrhizal fungus grow with ash. There's one in spring that's not even very tasty that I know of, but I don't know of any specific ash tree fungus that we go for in autumn. Below ash, you've got your rhododendrons and laurels. They're just no good for mushrooms. And then below them, you've got the whole maple family of trees, which is just rubbish if you're a forager. Um, and firmly at the bottom, with no edible mycorrhizal fungus in Britain that I know of, is the sycamore tree. So what that means is simple, you know, if you're in a wood full of sycamore in autumn looking for mushrooms, you're in the wrong place. Go somewhere else. Look for someone like this with mature beech, oak and birch, preferably with a bit of moss and a bit of grass and some other magnificent broadleaf surround as well. There you go. So let's go and have a look at our beefsteak fungus. And here we are at the base of this oak tree. We've got our beefsteak fungus. This one here is a young one looking uh, very much like a, an ox tongue. 
that's why it gets the other common name, the ox tongue fungus. It is an edible, this one. It's an edible that I consider really, really safe for novice foragers as well. I have done a whole other video on this mushroom, but basically when it comes to the polypores or the bracket type fungus that, that we go for as foragers, to me there's really only three. Uh, we go for chicken of the woods, which uh, has to be treated with a bit of caution because some people do react badly to chicken of the woods. This one here, beefsteak fungus, and uh, another one that I'm going to show you in just a second, the blackening polypore. The reason we go for those three is because they're all soft. Wow, that one's actually quite white inside. Normally, or I would uh, expect a beefsteak fungus of this size to be a bit more red they do often look just like a bit of Wagyu beef, nice and marbled. You can see the sort of burnt beefy effect on the cap of, or the top side of this mushroom. Fistulina hepatica, hepatica relating to your liver. Again, it looks a bit like a liver. And uh, on the underside, you can see it's much lighter. Now, if this was more red, maybe I can get it to happen from there. But by squeezing it, you kind of almost get a red blood-like effect coming out of the mushroom. Makes this one a really, really easy one to identify. And you can, if you find it, try a little bit raw. Beefsteak Carpaccio. It's, a, it's got a unique flavor for me in the mushroom world. It's not particularly mushroomy. It's more, um, it's got sort of an acidic side to the flavor, but it's useful in, uh, in sort of mixed mushroom dishes. There's nothing I would ever do with beefsteak just by itself though. Anyway, I'm gonna take this little bit. As I said, it's not one of my favorite mushrooms, so I'll leave the rest where it is growing here and show you a few more of our favorite trees under attack. Let's head just down here. First of all though, this is the kind of view you get when you come out foraging in these lovely places. And even when there's no mushrooms around, I still enjoy coming up here. Over here though, there's another mushroom I've done a, a video on before. Down here, this is the blackening polypore, Maripolis giganteus. And uh, the beefsteak fungus doesn't really do too much damage to the trees, but this one does, it, it rots the root system of the tree and quite often trees that have been infected with this for a while actually blow over. Um, where I used to live, there was quite a few trees on their sides uh, with this fungus all over around them in a, in a local wood to me down in Croydon in South London. Um, around here, there's some more of it. Showing you why it's called the blackening polypore. Blackens as it gets older blackens as it's damaged. Now, this is another one of those edible kind of bracket type fungus, if you like. Um, this is far too old to eat though. Sometimes, and that's not too bad actually, sometimes you can still cut off the edges of these big fronds and that does still feel nice and soft and edible. But these bits here, if I just show you, so when they get old they become extremely fibrous and uh, tough if you cook with them. Pretty sure you could still dry them out and pound them into something usable in the kitchen. Um, but when they're like this there's normally other mushrooms around for you to go for. And over here there's one that I do actually eat. backwards in its life cycle. Here's it in its um, rotten old stage. You can see there was quite a lot of it there. Here it's looking a bit younger. Again, underneath there actually, this is probably one of the best bits, but you can see underneath there, that white on the cap below, that's not mold, that's the spores. The white spores that have dropped out of this honey fungus, this one here, onto the cap below. Honey fungus has white spores. Now, around here, we've got 
some in reasonably good condition still. Now, these I would consider eating. Now, actually, they're not that uh, they're not that fresh after all. We might find some fresher ones a little bit further along. Um, but this is honey fungus. It would normally have a, a slightly more honey-coloured cap. As you can see, it has a ring on the skirt, on the stem rather, which is close, very close on this long stem to the cap of the mushroom. And it grows in clumps out of the bases of lots of different trees. Uh, and when it does, it's not good for the tree at all. Um, most fungus are good for trees. As I was explaining before, the saprophytes, what they do is they rot down all the old wood and they turn it back into compost for the trees. And the mycorrhizal fungus, they feed the trees. Um, this mushroom is one of the few that kills trees. Now, uh, this is a beech tree and he's still in reasonable condition. So he'll be able to live with this fungus for a, a number of years. An oak tree could live with honey fungus for a hundred years quite easily, I expect. Um, but things like our birch trees uh, are much more susceptible. And if honey fungus gets onto a birch tree, it can take it out in a matter of years. Um, they basically take from the tree. They take nutrition from the tree and kill it slowly that way. Um, they've also got two ways of spreading honey fungus so if you've got it in your garden and you think you can protect the other trees just by uh, picking all the mushrooms and stopping it sporing that won't work because underground this mushroom uh, has what are called rhizomorphs which are like little black kind of boot laces um, tightly woven bits of mycelium I assume which will spread uh, out underground from tree to tree so when you find your honey fungus quite often you'll find ones and twos dotted around in the area around the tree where you see the main fruiting bodies. It's uh, an incredible fungus. One of them in Oregon in America covers more than 2,000 acres in area underground and there is still trees there. You know, honey fungus has been on the British landmass probably longer than humans and uh, I'm pretty sure humans have killed more trees in that time than honey fungus has. So it's a, a part of our, our natural ecosystem, um, but if it's on your favourite oak tree in your garden, then uh, that oak tree is, like I said, under attack. Now, from an edibility point of view, honey fungus is edible to most people, but it makes some people sick. So you will find loads of it, and if you're tempted to try it, the first time you do, don't have very much. Just go for a small portion and uh, see what happens. Leave yourself 24 hours or so before you eat the next bit just to see if you have any kind of gastric reaction whatsoever. Um, the wind's picking up a little bit, which I know will be found uh, a little bit annoying by some of you on the camera microphone, but we'll plough on nonetheless. I do apologise. Right, we've come along a little bit further, not far at all, and down here there's a nice edible. There's a few of them around, so watch where you tread, Eric, but this is probably the best example. You can see that lovely green cap with almost like radial rings towards the edge. And if I pick it in, you'll see that the gills aren't really decurrent, but he is in the funnel cap family. You can see the cap's gone quite funnel shaped. This is the Clytocybe adora or uh, more commonly known as the aniseed toadstool. That lovely greeny colour. Now, the real key identifier for this mushroom is its smell. It's uh, much like the horse mushroom has a pungent aroma of aniseed. And this is a mushroom that has an aniseed flavour when you cook it. The horse mushroom doesn't, but this one does. So uh, use it wisely. Apparently it goes really well with lots of fish dishes, but I don't eat fish anymore, so I'll be using it for something different. Now behind it, over here, is a really common autumn mushroom. Uh, quite a lot around here. But this is one I want to show you because it's a, a really common one that you'll see a lot is a nice tall one and I'm getting down to the base of it because this is in the Amanita family and I want to show you all of its features there you go there's the big bulbous base 
which is actually the remnants of the egg sac it grew from. It's grown up. The cap used to be attached to the stem. Where it was attached to the stem, it's, it's left a skirt or a little veil. The gills are white. And uh, there's a little bit of the vulval remains on the cap there. It's mostly all brushed off on this. Now, uh, this looks really like the uh, Destroying Angel, but the Destroying Angel is quite rare. Um, this is a mushroom that I believe to be the false death cap. It looks like either the white variant of the death cap or the Destroying Angel. The way that you can tell the difference between them is quite simple. You use your nose, and uh, if I'm correct, what I get from this mushroom is the smell of raw potatoes. Um, I've never eaten it because apparently it tastes like raw potatoes as well, which isn't uh, particularly appetizing sounding. Um, but there we go, the false death cap. We get two versions of this, Amanita citrina and Amanita citrina var alba. They both smell of potatoes, leave them behind really. Uh, because they could be confused with some of the most poisonous mushrooms that we've got in the UK. Now if you can stand up carefully there Eric, we're gonna just wiggle around the corner here. Follow me. And we're gonna come over to... Sorry, I will get a collar mic one day. We're gonna come over uh, a mushroom that I consider to be very safe for novice foragers. And here it is, our lovely amethyst deceiver. I saw the flecks of purple in amongst this leaf litter. There's a, a youngster, and there's quite a few more little pinheads. There's a few more growing there. A couple of them that have gone rotten. Um, and uh, earlier on, I knew I was going to find some amethyst deceivers because you pretty much always do. They're a very common mushroom. And earlier on, I saw this mushroom, so I thought I'd pick it just to show you a quick comparison because uh, this is a deadly poisonous mushroom. And it's really the only worry, or the only worry I consider uh, when picking my amethyst deceivers. So this is the lilac fiber, ca fiber cap, um, or Inosibe geophila variant lilacina, and this is our amethyst deceiver, Lacaria amethystina. And uh, they don't look too similar now, but when this mushroom's younger, it can have uh, a similar purple coloring, and it will be small and, and closed, a bit like our younger versions that I showed you a second ago. Now, there is one key difference. Um, if you have a look at the gills, the gills on our amethyst deceiver, are bright purple. The gills on our deadly poisonous lilac fiber cap are kind of creamy color, off-white, certainly not purple. So if you're picking your amethyst deceivers, which I highly recommend, um, it's not a big mushroom, but they often uh, grow by the thousand, then just check the gills. Make sure that you've got purple gills and you're entirely safe. There we go, amethyst deceivers. I do find them one of the most beautiful mushrooms that we go foraging for. And he can go into my foraging bag. And I'm gonna take you now to the last few mushrooms for this video. And uh, here we are, a, a colourful end uh, to our little mushroom video. Down here, we've got the most prized edible that we've found today. Now they're not in perfect condition down there. They would normally be this same kind of bright yellow all over. But I am actually quite surprised to find these uh, in October. This is a mushroom that I first find in this particular area around June most years, and they go through summer and early autumn, um, but they're not a mushroom that tends to last too often into late autumn. Um, just from that view, I wouldn't be 100% sure of what they are, but here's one which I picked just a second ago, and you can see what we have here is a chanterelle, an October chanterelle. 
Now, chanterelles you can ID by a few different means. First of all, all the chanterelle family have what are called false gills. They're more like folds than actual bladed gills, which I'll show you in a second. And uh, this particular one, our Cantharellus sabarius, uh, is yellow on the outside, but the real test is when you cut them in half, you'll see the flesh inside the mushroom is white. Now, that white flesh rules out the only really potentially uh, dangerous look-alikes for this mushroom. Um, the false chanterelle is a mushroom that looks very similar to this, but it will have a similar colour to the outside, a sort of orangey yellow um, to the flesh as well. And so will the jack-o'-lantern, which is a, a fairly uncommon mushroom, but another one that can look a little bit similar to this that you don't want to eat. So our chanterelle is truly the, uh, the best find of the day. They're a mushroom that I really, really enjoy. Uh, I pickle them, I use them just like normal mushrooms. Um, they're a mushroom that are so pretty that along with our amethyst deceivers, I often uh, just fry them up briefly so that they keep their color and use them to decorate the tops of things like uh, our wild mushroom pate that we take on our walks. So this is the best mushroom that's going in the bag today and one that I'm really, really pleased to find. So. Just to finish off though, behind me, in the same patch as our chanterelles, we've got, oh, he's uh, fallen apart. And here's uh, another one. Now, this is a similarly colored mushroom looking very similar from the cap to our chanterelles. This isn't a mushroom in the chanterelle family though, you can tell that by those bladed gills. As I described, the chanterelles have false gills. Uh, this is a mushroom in the Russula genus, and the Russula genus is uh, called the brittle gill uh, family, um, to, uh, or those are, that's its common name. And it's called that because the gills in the family are all brittle, and when you run your fingers over, the gills of a, of a brittle gill, they flake like almonds. Now this is a useful family for, for foragers because they're so common. There's well over 200 types of brittle gill in the, the UK um, and quite a lot of them are actually edible. Um, but there are some that will make you sick. There's no deadly poisonous ones in the UK. There's one deadly poisonous one in Japan, as far as I know. But in the UK, uh, we don't have any seriously toxic brittle gills. The worst a brittle gill can do to you is make you sick. Now, it's uh, an interesting family um, for foragers because there's a test you can do when you know you've got a brittle gill, and I exercise extreme caution before doing this. I did a video on the death cap not so long ago, and the death cap looks quite similar to a young brittle gill unless you examine it closely. Um, but when you're sure you've got a brittle gill, what you can do to determine whether you've got an edible or a poisonous one is actually have a nibble of the mushroom. And this one here um, is one that's worrying me, but I'll do the nibble test anyway. Um, what you do, chew the mushroom up a little bit and leave it on the tip of your tongue. And um, yes, I have a toxic brittle gill here. Now, I've no problem in swallowing the tiny little nibble that I had uh, because I know that these aren't seriously toxic. They're just emetic, they'll make you sick. But the reason I know that this one's poisonous is because it burnt the tip of my tongue and it's actually still quite hot in my mouth, a little bit like a, a piece of chili. All of the poisonous brittle gills in the UK will do that if you uh, have a nibble of them. And this one, with its coloring, and uh, let's have a little smell. Yeah, there's a, a bit of a plant-like smell there. What I think I've got here is the geranium-scented russula and it's known, like I've uh, just found out, as one of the toxic ones. But knowing about this family will enhance all of your foraging walks for mushrooms because when there's no chanterelles and no amethyst deceivers and no porcinis and beefsteak fungus, there is always a russula somewhere. And there's a few 
that I do really like to eat. The yellow swamp rustula is great, the charcoal burner is great, the green cracked rustula is one that I really like, and the rustula parazuria, the powdery brittle gill, that's another one that I really like. But having a nibble of a mushroom to determine whether it's edible or not is not something I would advise any true beginners to do. Wait until you're a hundred percent confident in IDing the family that your mushroom's in before you start having nibble tests. <laughs> right, I think what we'll do is we'll leave it there and I'm gonna go home now and, and cook some mushrooms and try my hand at video editing. I hope you've enjoyed this. Leave us a like if you did.